So speaking of things that native grasses can do for you, I put together this list right here. And it's maybe not a complete list. It may not be a perfect list. It may not even be a good list. But those are certainly some things that I think native grasses can contribute to a forage program on a farm. And uh, so what I'm going to do is, is walk through each of these. And some may not seem like they pertain too much to any given operation. But on the other hand, I think there are a few of those that probably pertain to every operation. Uh, certainly uh, drought resilience uh, comes to mind. Anyway, let me deal with each one of these. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on any of them because there are several on the list and see what we can learn. So let's start off with this growing classes of animals. Uh, you see four categories there that, that occur to me as growing classes of animals. Maybe I'm missing something, but I think that's a pretty good little list. And what we know about these is that the common denominator is high rates of gain. For each one of these, we want high rates of gain and we want uh, inexpensive gain as well, certainly. So uh, let, let's take a look at some data that tells us where we stand on this. And, and I've shared this with uh, different ones in, in talks that I've done, as Valerie mentioned out there in Missouri. Uh, but you see there switchgrass and big blue stem Indian grass, good rates of gain. Uh, certainly adequate for stockering and, and maybe more than adequate. If we put this on a per head basis, you can see down here this note that what that worked out to in our studies was about 230 pounds, give or take, over what was roughly a 100-day summer grazing season on the big blue stem Indian grass blend, and a little bit under that, 195 pounds for the switchgrass. But, you know, those are good enough numbers to justify uh, and a long enough grazing season at 100, 100 plus days to be able to justify bringing in a load of uh, stalker steers and running them and make, trying to make some money off that. I, I'd point out to you too, by the way, that this big blue stem Indian grass blend and that, that rate of gain we're seeing there is something that's really not so new or different with us. In fact, if, if I go south and west of uh, where Valerie there is in Chillicothe by I'm guessing three, maybe four hours, uh, I wind up in something known as the Kansas Flint Hills, where they've been running stalkers on this grass and getting those kind of gains for, I expect, a better part of 150 years at this point. And so it's kind of a tried and true system, and it's certainly something that we can use native grasses to do. Uh, what about heifer development? Here's three studies. Uh, these data come from three studies, let me put it that way, where we've looked at weaned heifers there in that first row, uh, bred beef heifers, and some two, uh, one study with two different grasses for bred dairy heifers. And what I basically want you to see here is that when you think about heifer development, these numbers are generally very much in line with what we want. I do want to put in a, a quick uh, disclaimer, if you will, or apology for, for Eastern Gamma grass. That number doesn't look as good as the others. But we've got four years of grazing data on that species in this trial. And the first year, and this so often happens with us when we're getting our experience grazing native grasses at a new location, we uh, didn't do so well. And, and the common denominator is always getting behind the forage. These things grow enough that they, they tend to blow past you if you're not careful. And that's really what happened to us that first year. So we had pretty abysmal gains that first year. I forget the exact number, but I'll say a pound a day. Maybe it was even below that. The next three summers, we averaged about 1.45 or very, very similar to switchgrass. So I put that number up there because that's what we measured. But if you wanted to know what gamma grass can do for you, I think it would be comparable to switchgrass. It's also worth pointing out in these two studies up here, we intentionally never applied nitrogen. This study down here, we applied 60 units uh, each summer of the, the four years that we grazed. So again, it's pretty obvious we can do heifer development with these grasses. Um, another perspective on this data is our rate of gain across the summer. And so what you see there, this is the exact same study I showed you with the steers uh, two slides back, but this just breaks it out per month. And again, what you can see here is we start off uh, early in the season with some pretty gaudy rates of gain, and they tail off over the summer, kind of what we expect with any grass. Uh, and then in August, you can see that we got these pretty, pretty marginal rates of gain. But I do want to point out that come August, what is your alternative? You can be on your fescue that still hasn't really geared back up at that time of year, 
and certainly not do any better than that, probably worse. If you happen to have a uh, common Bermuda grass, depending on where you are in Missouri, uh, by August, you, I don't even think you're going to be doing that. So not, not an impressive number there at the end of the summer, but, but still serviceable. And it's a place for the animals to be that they're not beating up your cool season forages. But let me show you a, another study that we did more recently. Uh, this is with the big blue stem Indian grass blend, and these are weaned steers. And we, we tried two different season long management approaches. The, the continuous was a set stocking rate, steer and a half per acre all summer, never changed it. The heavy early, we, we started off with more steers. And then in late June, we, we shed a bunch of them so that the second half of the summer, we had fewer steers than the continuous. That wasn't a huge shift. It was uh, about 25%. But what I want you to see is speaking of management is under the continuous grazing, uh, we had lighter stocking and therefore higher selectivity. The steers didn't have to fight for the best bites and, and we got darn good gain. And if you look at that number, 2.69 pounds a day, that, that's very similar to what you see uh, for May and June. If you kind of average those out in the previous study there in the top chart. The heavy early steers had to compete more and had less selectivity, and so they didn't do quite as well. But what I really want you to see out of this chart is the influence that all this had late in the season. We don't have this broken out by month. We, we do have it available by the, the pre and post stocking adjustment. So late June is a real breaking point. And what you see is just like in the initial study where we see yields or excuse me, gains tail off late in the season. Uh, that's really what we've got going on here, that 1.41 pounds. But with the heavy early, where we reduced stocking and allowed some fresh regrowth of that grass and increased selectivity, we were able to maintain a, a pretty daggone impressive rate of gain for the second half of the summer. And to me, where this kind of comes in is the idea of some background. And we've talked about steer stockering. We've talked about heifer development. But you think about this, if you're a fall cavern, that's really probably what this applies to, and you can hang on to your steers uh, for, say, two months here. And, and remember, switchgrass is horrible forage, right? Well, if it's horrible forage, I'd, I'd hate to see what good forage will do for you. But th these two months right here, if you just held your calves for 60 days, that's some pretty impressive gain. And if you wanted to hold those calves until late summer and, and you're willing to kind of manipulate your stocking a little bit, you can maintain some pretty good rates right on through summer. And I'm of the opinion that the, the absolute easiest uh, improvement in your bottom line you can make as a beef cattle operator is to hang on to these calves if you can do it cheaply and effectively post weaning, pre-marketing, and grab some of that background and weight gain. Uh, that, is, that is a heck of a good place, uh, a sweet spot to make some extra money. And just to prove how important management is. I mentioned that gamma grass study in those heifers that did uh, 1.25 pounds averaged, uh, but the last three years did 1.46 pounds. So this is an accident that happened to us one summer. We knocked this paddock to the ground in July. And so we backed off our stocking, never completely destocked it. We just pulled some animals out. And about three or four weeks later, that's what it looked like. And that, that picture, August 13th, so help me. And it's completely anecdotal, but our rate of gain from that paddock for that way period, single way periods are, are pretty daggone iffy, so don't take this to the bank, but was about 1.8 pounds on those heifers. And looking at that forage there, that's not really a shock if, if that is a real and, and fair number. But the point is this, is we can have some pretty darn good summer forage. And I look at that picture, and if that doesn't get your attention uh, for growing classes of animals on August 13th, I, I don't know what I can do for you. Uh, so. If you'll allow me, I'm going to put a check mark here by stockering, heifer development, backgrounding. These are things native grasses can do for you. Now, I haven't said much about grass finishing, but we know the name of the game in grass finishing is high rates of gain. And I think we've made a pretty good case for high rates of gain. Uh, one other thought, though, that I think is important to keep in mind about grass finishing is we often focus on fall calves for grass finishing if we have the flexibility to not have to market routinely throughout the year. But the advantage, of course, of fall calves is that you've, post weaning anyway, you've got two summer seasons and only one winter season to carry them. And if you think about those two summer seasons, that's eight months of grazing out of the 16 months those animals will graze during this production cycle, the 16 months post weaning. 
And so though eight of those 16 months, you could get these high rates of gain during summer. And as I'll talk about here in a little bit, some very inexpensive forage. And so to me, again, a good tool for grass finishing. So high rates of gain, helpful for growing classes of animals. Next thing on my list, drought. The one thing we can say for certain about drought is it's going to come. Uh, this is a North Missouri picture. Uh, Valerie mentioned I've been up there uh, in the winter. I had the privilege, I guess, of being up there in July of 2018. And unfortunately, that's what the world looked like. And I think you all recognize that's a fescue pasture and it's not real happy. Uh, fescue is a cool season grass, what we call a C3 photosynthetic pathway. And, you know, C3 grass is like uh, 70 to 75 degrees and lots of rain. So think New Zealand, think Oregon, think Scotland, think Ireland. Um, on the other hand, same day, same county. This is at Linnaeus, by the way, for those of y'all familiar with that. This is a big blue stem Indian grass stand. And uh, big difference. Why the difference? Well, it's because these are warm season or C4 grasses. Again, a different metabolic pathway. And these grasses really like the mid 90s that's their preferred temperature range and you know three four five six weeks without rain not really a big deal and there's a name for 95 degrees and four five six weeks without rain it's called summer in missouri and let's face it folks that, that's coming to a, a farm near you very soon I, I don't know if it'll be 2021 or 2022 but let's face it it's on its way one way or another and so these c4 grasses are a great tool to fight drought the other thing about these natives that helps them fight drought is these deep root systems. I, I picked this thing off the uh, internet, but again, you, you can find other pictures like this. These native grasses grow some pretty daggone bodacious, high volume, very deep root systems that allow them to suck water out of the ground that tall fescue, the, the root uh, would, would barely penetrate uh, to this, this gentleman's head here. Uh, it'd, it'd be shallower than that. And so much better adapted to deal with drought. And we've heard a lot about soil health. I'm not going to get into it, but that's a picture I just think is so cool. It's from the Dust Bowl. Uh, National Geographic had printed it. And uh, this is a clump of big blue stem that man is sitting in. And you can see the effect it had on reducing wind erosion in the high plains. Let me show you a little data on the subject of drought tolerance to try to drive this point home. This is a four-year trial that was done in West Tennessee. It was looking at switchgrass yields as a function of some different management issues, but it was not focused on drought. Over that four-year study, the mean yield for the switchgrass was, uh, if I remember the exact figure, 7.6 tons per acre. So pretty high yield. Now, what nobody knew when they started the trial, just like we don't know when the next drought is going to be, is that 2007 was one of the worst droughts recorded in Tennessee, and at least during the growing season, 2008 was not much better. So what is really impressive, though, is that during this really severe drought, this switchgrass produced 65% of your four-year average, which works out to be five tons per acre. Now, to put that in perspective, folks, if Missouri is a lot like Tennessee in many respects and uh, the rough yield estimate statewide in Tennessee is about two and a half tons per acre on tall fescue. That's average management, average weather. And Missouri, I, maybe I'll do a little better, maybe do a little worse. But either way, two and a half is only one half of five, if, if you can follow me on that math. So. I'm doubling our normal forage production in one of the driest summers on record. Again, that's pretty impressive when you think about it and is a pretty good testimony to the ability of these grasses to deal with drought because of these extremely deep root systems and the C4 metabolism. I want to take just a little detour for a minute, though, uh, and this, this has everything in the world to do with drought, but plant physiologists know that as you go north uh, so your latitude gets greater. You know, if you're down around Louisiana somewhere, C4 grasses dominate completely. Uh, you, you get up to uh, northern uh, Minnesota, North, North Dakota, for instance, C3 grasses dominate, cool season grasses. Plant physiologists figure that the, the point where warm season grasses lose their competitive advantage is about 45 degrees north. Now, if you're like me, the first thing that goes through my mind is, well, where the heck is 45 degrees north? Well, I'm going to throw this map up here for you and show you where 45 degrees north is. It's Minneapolis. 
So what I'm telling you is that south of this line, and of course the lake states influence climate, so that line really would have dipped around about like this, uh, warm season grasses were historically the dominant grasses of the eastern United States. Even up here, by the way, into southeastern corner of Maine, eastern Massachusetts, Long Island, uh, northern Ohio, southern Michigan, southern uh, Wisconsin, Again, warm season grasses are what dominated the grasslands of the region. So a 1930 uh, study that evaluated still existing prairies, 90 years ago, I guess it was, uh, found that the prairies here were 100% C4 grasses, big blue stem basically. Northwest Missouri, not far from where Valerie is in, in uh, Chillicothe, 98% warm season grass dominance. And uh, way up in northeastern Nebraska, 76% warm season grass dominance. So you can see that these warm season grasses are what has grown here for thousands of years. Now, it's no accident that I use this fescue map for the base layer here. And this is where fescue is dominant, roughly. We, we could kind of quibble with that line a little bit, but you get the idea. So the take home here then is that the fescue belt lies entirely in an area that historically and still to a large extent today is dominated by C4 grasses. So what we're doing is we're taking a C3 or cool season grass, now a tough one, an exceptionally drought tolerant one, a very resilient one, but nevertheless, we're asking a C3 grass to do the job of a C4 grass. And I'm not a climate forecaster. We've all heard the forecasts, whether they're going to be correct over the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years. None of us know. But if they're at all true, if we are at all heading toward hotter, drier, uh, more variable climate conditions, then a C3 grass is going to have a harder and harder time holding its own, especially when you consider it's growing in the middle of a place that historically the climate and environment favored C4 grasses. So uh, if you'll let me, I'm going to put a check mark here next to drought resilience because these, again, are incredibly drought resilient grasses. Let's talk about to fescue toxicosis, and, and we don't need to dwell long on this. We all know the story. We, we've been told it for years, uh, the cattle in the ponds in the summer. And I don't know if you can notice this, but th there's a few uh, just hanging out under the tiny shade patch under this tiny tree. And we all know that's because basically they have elevated body temperatures and they're suffering. Well, one thing you do notice though, is there's a whole lot of cattle here, one heading to the pond, some hiding under the shade, some in the pond, but you don't see them out there grazing. So, so no forage intake, because again, it's, it's hot and they're miserable. Uh, this is data right out of uh, Missouri, Mount Vernon, as I recall, but this shows the toxin in the fescue and the pattern it, it has during the course of the year, at least in this study. And the important thing I want you to get from this is that during spring, these toxin levels are increasing rapidly. This is at a time when fescue quality, just never mind the toxin, is naturally going down as the plants mature. And so your rate of gain across this period here might be going from 1.6 or 7 or 8 even here in early spring to about 1.2 or 1.0 late in spring into the early summer. So you got declining performance coupled with a dramatic increase in the level of toxicity. And at least for spring calving herds, this also happens to correspond to the heart of our breeding season. And so let me show you a study. This one was done in South Carolina, but they took a group of cows and they put them on uh, hot fescue and they AI'd them in early April. And then they remained on that hot fescue for the duration of the pregnancy. This group of cattle, randomly selected and split out, started off on the same hot fescue, but after being AI'd in early April, they were moved to a non-toxic forage, something like, in this case, it wasn't native grasses, but something like native grasses, which are non-toxic. And so the, the point here is there was a dramatic loss in uh, calves associated with those animals being on that hot fescue post breeding. And so what we know is if we can get away from that great big spike in ergovalines that occurs in April, May, and June, or certainly May and June, I probably should say, then you're going to have better calving success. And by the way, that same study showed that the weaned calves gave up between heifer and bull calves, 31 uh, pounds per head, 
Another study that was done in Georgia, also looking at hot fescue, found that uh, animals on that hot fescue gave up the, the numbers you see there for the, for the steers, uh, 62, and, and for the heifers, 44 pounds a head. So you get hit twice, fewer calves and, and lighter calves. So definitely not good for business. So again, we, I think, can safely conclude that we can get some relief, very strategic relief from uh, fescue toxicosis from native grasses. So that's another way they can benefit your farm. Let's talk about these extended grazing seasons. Everybody's seen a curve like this at one point or another, I'm sure, that shows the relative growth seasons of the warm and cool season grasses. I always think it's worth emphasizing that the uh, cool season grass curve is based on production. So this is fewer pounds of forage produced per acre. But you know, it's not just quantity that deteriorates in the summer for cool season grasses, it's quality and therefore animal intake and therefore animal and performance. So you're kind of getting hit from several angles. And so the first and obvious way that warm season grasses can extend your grazing season just as simply as a complement during that summer slump. It can give you a lot better grazing as we've seen and, and plenty more grazing days over the course of that summer uh, for that higher carrying capacity, which you can see there is pretty dramatically different. But there's another way that this benefits us is that if I am grazing warm season grasses in the summer and not the cool season grasses, I can rest my cool season grasses. Now this is a picture from the Piedmont of the Carolinas uh, and that pasture don't look so good. It, it's obviously summertime. I, I see dirt. I see dirt in the foreground. We don't have a real good stand of grass. I think on this hillside, I didn't take this picture, Jim Green, formerly of NC State University took it. But looks to me like that hillside starting to wash away. I see dirt up there and I see some nub down short grass. And uh, I don't know, uh, Valerie, I probably have more confidence in your ability to provide me a BCS there, but I believe I see some ribs. So we're, we're not where we want to be. That's not good for soil health. It's not good for animal performance. It's not good for uh, pasture health. Uh, and we know that because these cool season grasses are, are trying to naturally slow down in the summer, they're already under stress, that when we graze them like this, we're moving from plants with vigorous tops, no vigorous tops over here, except I guess that's probably Cerecia lespedes up on that hillside, but, but no vigorous roots. What we've done, and we've known this for over 100 years, right? Some of those studies I mentioned from the 20s and 30s did this. They, they dug up heavily grazed and not so heavily grazed plants. And, and what we know is that you take away the top, for an extended period of time and there's your root system and those roots are not well positioned to handle drought or any additional stress and so we know that resting cool season and grasses in the summer is a great idea and it gives us the ability to allow them to really do what they can do for us and that's provide tremendous early and late season forage but you know in addition to good early and late season forage Rested cool season grasses give us another really good opportunity, stockpiling. And, you know, these cattle are still out on pasture. They've got plenty of forage in front of them, depending on who you talk to and their circumstances in the winter. Th there are folks that are able to push their stockpile, certainly into December, but in some cases, February, and I've even heard of early March. But they, they're, they're out on pasture, they're not in the mud, and you're not feeding hay. And all of these are good things. And one of y'all's folks out there, Wes Tucker, worked with me to put together some numbers. He, he's done some, in fact, he, he in, on his own does a lot of uh, stockpiling the fescue. But again, like most economic valuations, there's certain assumptions here, 40 units of nitrogen, hay at $89 a ton. You can make whatever assumptions you want, but it's really hard to get away from the fact that hay is going to cost you more than grazing. And so uh, it's an opportunity to save money. One other way that I think is really important that native grasses can offer you to extend grazing seasons might not be one you think of offhand, but marginal sites. So this field in lower middle Tennessee, you, th these are all sedges here you see growing. Um, I'm not sure the day I was out there to take this picture if it was the case, but there was plenty of places as you walked across the field, you would have been standing in water. Uh, Virginia buttonweed was growing in there, uh, more sedges there, and there was plenty of smartweed. So it's a very wet site. But we worked with this producer, and you can make out here these switchgrass seedlings. So we planted it to switchgrass, not much grazing in, in these uh, wet weather uh, swamp weeds, right? 
This is that same field a year later with his cattle out there. Switchgrass is filled in the stand. It's a tremendous stand of switchgrass. And this guy is not a big operator. I, I don't really remember. I'll say he's got 30, 35 head, but he's a full-time vet, large animal vet, and, and he raises cattle on the side. But he is able to keep his entire herd of mamas on this one switchgrass pasture all summer long because of the productivity of it. More grazing days, extending the grazing season. And you know, on the other end of the spectrum, we'll get up out of the swamp. This is a coal reclaimed coal surface mine in eastern Kentucky. There is no soil out here. It's stone, rock, chert. It's nasty. I'm pretty safe, I think, in saying nobody in Missouri, unless you're in the Ozarks, got a site this bad. But what's growing on it besides some weeds is a whole bunch of big blue stem, little blue stem and Indian grass, and it's giving us grazing days. And so we can bring marginal sites up to a much higher level of productivity by uh, taking advantage of them with grasses that are, because they're native, adapted to grow on them. So again, native grasses, uh, you know, high growth rates, excellent drought resilience, dodging fescue toxicosis, but taken all together, these good tools can extend our grazing season. So let, let's talk a little bit about economics, the bottom line. So I've shown this chart before and dang on it, I'm going to keep showing this uh, till the cows come home because I think it's some really, really important data. So this is National Cattle and Beef Association's program they had a few years back. And this particular analysis drew from 475 herds over 15 years. They divided these herds up into these different operations into quartiles based on economic performance. And they looked for what helped determine which buckets you fell in. And what it came down to is the amount of grass you had for your animals. So the folks that performed the best allowed the most grass for their animals. The folks that performed the poorest allowed the least amount of grass for their animals. So more grass equals more profitability. How much profitability? Well, here's the rates of returns that the economists there at Texas uh, A&M calculated. 6.6% to the good, minus 7.4% to the bad. Pretty big swing. One other thing that I've noticed on this graph that I think is really instructive is there's a four plus percent difference in performance, which is a pretty big deal, uh, just between 23 and 24 and a half acres. So just maybe a uh, five, six percent increase in grass can have a huge impact when you're at this end of the spectrum. So again, this doesn't say a thing about native grasses, C3, C4. What it says is more grass is better because it's the cheapest way to feed your animals. Now, what I have not told you is that this data set, these 475 herds were drawn from uh, ranches in Oklahoma, Texas, and New Mexico. And so what I expect may come to your mind when I say that is, well, hang on, Kaiser, we're way up in Missouri, man. That's, that's almost desert country down there. That doesn't have any applicability to where we are. Well, not so fast, my friend, as Lee Corso likes to say. Uh, Iowa State University took SPA data from Iowa, Wisconsin, and Minnesota, and they did a completely different approach to their analysis to it. They did something called a regression model. So they were trying to find out what factors contributed to enterprise profitability. And bottom line, feed. And, and we all know that, but here's, here's the way it's actually been measured. So 57% of the variability in operations that are profitable or not profitable comes down to feed cost. The second highest, way, way, way down at 9% is heavy metal addiction, right? Depreciation. And so whether you're in New Mexico or Minnesota, it's all about the feed cost it, and grass is the answer. So again, we still haven't said a thing about natives, but we have said is cheap feed matters. So let's look at natives. The studies I showed you earlier on, uh, bred heifers and on weaned steers and weaned heifers, we've calculated cost of gain. And you can see the numbers there. And those are some really, really cheap numbers, about as cheap as you can get. And part of the reason they're so cheap is on the one hand, we get high rates of gain that we've already talked about. We also have high carrying capacities, which we really haven't said much about. But also we've got really low pasture costs. These grasses are cheap to grow. So this is an analysis a former graduate student of mine did with working with our ag economists. 
And it's a model that, that was developed. This right here actually is just a spreadsheet using ex normal extension recommendations. So, you know, normal rates of nitrogen, phosphorus, herbicide, planting costs prorated over 10 years, which again, standard operate procedure for ag economists. And what you can see is switchgrass is cheaper to grow, lower inputs uh, than tall fescue and Bermuda grass. It, it is a cheap date. And of course, th this one happens to be looking at big blue, or excuse me, switchgrass. We could be looking at big blue stem and it's a little more expensive than switchgrass, but not much more. Uh, Eastern gram of grass would be more expensive still, mainly because the seed is high and probably get closer to tall fescue. But regardless, we have cheap pasture. And so that contributes to low along with high rates of gain and high carrying capacity, low cost of gain. And so this can contribute to moving you, uh, if I back up for a second, to this graph, it can contribute to moving you from this end to that end. Maybe it's only taking you from here to here, or here to there, but the point is it's going in the correct direction. So bottom line, favorable to us. Last thing I want to talk about is building a system. And what I mean by that is that the, the research we've done to date has been about largely growing classes of animals rather than cow-calf pairs. Uh, and it's been field level. So how does this pasture function with native grasses? Well, the next question is, or pair of questions is, how does it work in cow-calf operations, which is most of our producers, number one. And number two, if you fit it into a system, into your overall forage program, what's the ripple effect? How does it impact hay feeding, hay production? Uh, and, and ultimately profitability. So unfortunately, the data out there to answer that question is sorely lacking. Th these are very difficult studies to do, very expensive studies to do, and consequently, not many of them have been done. Now, this is a study that University of Illinois did several years ago. Unfortunately, they never published it. I tried to track down the authors of the study. They're all retired and don't have any recollection of the study, particularly where we can get more information on it. And uh, the experiment station where it was conducted, likewise, they can't find anything on it, which is another argument why we need to publish this stuff. But anyway, what they did is they, they took tall fescue in the spring, left animals on tall fescue in the summer, moved animals onto one of two alternative forages, big blue stem or eastern gamma grass for the summer, and then went back on fescue in the fall. So this is what we mean by a grazing system. So as much grazing as the, the system will allow, we, we want to put together a forage package that'll carry us that entire time. And of course, what you can see here is that Gee, tall fescue doesn't do much in the summer. We kind of know that already. And in their case, they, they did a lot better on eastern gamma grass than on the big blue stem. But overall, by using a summer complement, they didn't get rid of their fescue. They just complemented it. They did a heck of a lot better, almost doubling uh, in the case eastern gamma grass, the overall system gain. There are some trials done up in uh, Nebraska that have showed something similar. Uh, where we see increased rates of gain. And it's not because we do better in the fall or we do better in the spring. It's because we're doing better in the summer. But again, not published. And I'm a little bit leery about what actually underlies the study because it hasn't been through that process. Another cut at it is this uh, same student that, that just finished up, Kyle Brazel, got with our ag economist and we took those pasture cost numbers I just showed you and we put them into a little more complex model. So what, what this model does is it looks at the profitability based on something called net present value, which is just the, the net, val net returns on an annual basis discounted back to the present over a 10-year horizon. And, and what uh, we see is that if you assume that you've already got tall fescue pastures, you don't pay anything to establish them, you just pay to manage them on an annual basis, and you take switchgrass on 30% of your forage base and establish it, so you take your operational cost of running switchgrass each year, plus your establishment costs prorated. Do the same thing with our Bermuda grass. Uh, what we see is that our overall net present value relative to the fescue only system goes up a little bit with Bermuda, goes up a lot with switchgrass. We throw in a cost share, maybe through uh, NRCS's EQIP program or state of Missouri may have some cost share out there. Uh, you can see we boost it a little more. Uh, we didn't include the cost share for Bermuda grass because to my knowledge, most people aren't cost sharing Bermuda grass, but for the natives, I think there's some opportunities available. And so we push that profitability even higher. 
And, and what's driving this increased profitability with the 30% switch grass are the things we've talked about, uh, less loss of calf crop from fescue toxicosis, higher weaning weights, uh, less hay feeding. And so we think this is a reasonable approximation, but it is a model. And so we take it with a grain of salt where we're not going to bet the family farm on it, but it gives us some insight into what may be going on. So what we'd really like to do is do some research. And fortunately, we just got awarded a grant from USDA uh, and it's going to enable us to do a uh, three-year grazing project at three locations. So right there in Lenius, down in Boonville, Arkansas, and right here in East Tennessee, and uh, using spring cows. So we're going to have cow-calf pairs. And what we're going to evaluate is systems. And this is eerily similar to what was done in Illinois. So we're looking at all fescue, summer long, fall, spring, the, the whole time it's a fescue-based pasture, versus a fescue-based pasture system where one third of it has been converted to eastern gamma grass. In Missouri, it'll be big blue stem Indian grass blend and Arkansas has a little more space than the other two. And so we're actually looking at both treatments there. And so what we hope to get out of this is start to answer some of those questions I just put up there about how does this impact calving rates, weaning weights, profitability, what's the ripple effect on hay production, uh, overall program carrying capacity, the things that really matter to a cow-calf operation. So we are tickled with that opportunity and excited to be able to work there at Linnaeus and, and uh, hopefully uh, bother the heck out of Valerie over the next several years as this project moves forward. I want to wrap up with uh, letting you know that although we have not talked uh, about uh, establishment of native grass forages, we haven't talked about grazing management per se, there is uh, at this web address right here, a bunch of information. There's what we're calling our Native Grass College, which is a video series. This particular one I'm showing here is on establishment. And taken all together, if you watch the whole video, I believe it's probably about 40 minutes. I've sort of forgotten, maybe 45 minutes. But if you don't really wanna see the whole video, all the little pieces parts are broken out and you can just pick the one that you wanna see. And with each one of these courses, there's a other resources tab, which includes things like these that, that you can download. To date, we've got three courses up there, if you will, establishment, grazing management, and competition control. My name is Rick Rath. I'm a private land conservationist with the Department of Conservation down in the southwest part of the state. Um, <clears throat> I work a lot with cattlemen around this area, um, incorporating some warm season grass into grazing systems. Uh, as a wildlife biologist and a, a cattleman myself, it's really hard to talk about the wildlife benefits of native grass without getting roped back into the livestock benefits and everything we just heard from Dr. Kaiser. Um, they're so directly related to one another, and you'll you'll understand and realize that a lot of the stuff that Dr. Kaiser was recommending for the livestock management is also what we as wildlife biologists recommend for the uh, the wildlife management aspect of native grasses. So why is uh, the Department of Conservation, why is the state agency that's tasked with protecting the wildlife of the state um, concerned with grazing? And the short answer is years ago we started uh, grazing some of our native prairies and what we were finding is we were producing a lot more and we we're using quail as our kind of our keystone species that we were realizing we were producing a lot more quail and other grass and wildlife on prairies where we're we're using cattle as the primary management tool. Um, this led to a pretty uh, intense study over the last five years with radio mark quail that I'll get into a little bit later. But uh, um, we found that you know these cattle are the most efficient management tool that we have. And if we really want to affect the, the grassland bird, grassland aggregate wildlife species, we need to use grazing. Um, however, our, our conservation areas are only a small portion of the, the total landscape. And if we really want to affect a, a large scale, you know, if we want to have a large scale effect, we need to work with private landowners. So you'll notice uh, the Department of Conservation, and we're going to be in, in a lot of these grazing workshops especially you know not only grazing systems but more importantly incorporating native warm season grasses into grazing systems and properly managing those so 
when I say grassland, I'll look at uh, we really focus on the grassland birds. And the main re one of the reasons is that over the last 50 years, we've seen a 50% decline in grassland birds. That's pretty alarming. Um, there's, you know, a lot of different factors that go into that, but one of the main ones is the the use of non-native grasses and grazing systems. And, you know, we're in cattle country here. Um, there's a lot of fescue. There's also a lot of, a lot of our prairie got tilled up and now farmed. Um, but also a lot of non-native grass. So you may you may look at this picture and say, well, meadow larks, we, we have plenty of meadow larks. And, you know, just going out and, and you, may know, you may think we do, but long-term studies have shown that even the common species that we are, are steeply declining to the point of, you know, this is maybe on the, the other end of that, but some species have disappeared altogether largely due to to uh, the loss of our native grasslands. So uh, this grassland bird group is a, is a lot of species. Each species has a different need. Um, some like it thin, some like it thick. Um, we use quail for our, our main species of concern because they require some diversity and they'll let you know uh, when the grass is too thick maybe when it's overgrazing too thin, but they like the mix. And that's what we're looking for on, on farms, private landowner, you know, on the farms we're working on, we're looking for a good diverse mix of, um, of grass varying stages of growth. So we, if you've been through one of any of our workshops, you've probably seen this. Um, this is just a kind of a diagram of different birds using different um, management techniques in pastures. Most of the South Missouri, we're gonna see some of this fescue pasture. Usually it's grazed pretty short and um, doesn't provide a whole lot of cover. When we get into even Northern Missouri and some of the CRP and even public land that we are, are not allowed to graze for whatever reason, um, we get the grass is too thick and almost you know, there's there's less use on it. So what we're, we're really aiming for is we want that middle, that moderate, right there in the middle, a good mix of uh, properly grazed grass in different stages of succession, um, but not too not too short, not too thick. This is kind of the far left hand side of that. Um, this is not a good situation, even though you know every farm may have some of this, and that's fine. You got to have some sacrifice paddock things like that. However, uh, uh, an entire farm grazed this close is not good for the wildlife, it's not good for the soil, it's not good for the cattle, and, or the cattle, and it's probably not very profitable as well. So we want to get away from that. But we don't want to go too far to the right and have uh, grass that's so thick that nothing besides coyotes and deer will live in there. We need a management tool to, to bring in some diversity, um, not uniform, but we want some disturbance on the landscape. And the best thing we can do is graze it. Throw the cows out there in a managed um, environment, manage time, manage stocking rates, and they will provide the ideal habitat for us while providing um, profitability for the, the producer. Basically, the cattle are going to gradually reduce the grass dominance in a native grass stand. Um, throughout the summer months, especially when the fescue, you know, the fescue based farms are, are struggling, this warm season grass is going to provide some high quality forage while also providing some really high quality habitat for grass and obligate wildlife. Um, as I said, we don't, we want diversity across the landscape. So, the cattle are the, the primary management tool. We do use and recommend fire in native grass stands. However, we don't want to burn the entire native grass stand. So large scale burns remove um, all the habitat at one time and, per, and basically produce uniformity. Haying also will, will do the same thing. Gradually decreasing, you know, over the summer months, decreasing that grass dominance will result in something more like this, where you have within this, the, an individual paddock, you have multiple stages of 
succession in that grass. So, you know, up on the hill in that picture, that may have been unburned this year. This is a, probably a midsummer picture. Um, so it was unburned, so the cattle are not grazing that too hard. The lower portion, maybe it was burned in the spring. The cattle are adhering to that burn portion because there is um, the, the growth there is fresher and more nutritious. So we can move the cattle with our burns rather than fences in some situations. This is um, this picture and the next one will show as a wildlife biologist, we're looking for this. This is um, basically a warm stew grass stand that has been grazed. We have bare ground, we have overhead cover with the, the weeds or the forbs that were produced. However, on the cattleman side, there's a lot of grass here that got ate this summer and it's continually growing. So this is another picture you'll see. The grass was ate by the cows. We're, we're providing some bare ground, overhead cover, some diversity. That diversity is gonna uh, produce insects and bugs, which uh, our, our grassland birds, especially the young um, broods, are gonna heavily rely on through the summer months. This, uh, again, probably great. This may have got a little ahead of the cattle, but we're still producing some ideal habitat in this picture the cows look happy and healthy and as dr kaiser showed in one of his slides when the fescue cows were in the pond under the shade tree this is the middle of the day the cows are out grazing which is good so as i said we're, we really manage for the quail because they're a good indicator of, of good habitat um, when a quail is hatched out of its nest it's the size of a bumblebee very small and when they hatch, they want to get away from the nest. They want to get away from where they've been and hit the trail and get out of there. So in an undisturbed grass stand, it's almost impossible. The grass is so thick, it doesn't allow for mobility of the if it, you know, If it's too thick, they can get wet with dew and actually have hypothermia in the, in the summer months. So when we use grazing, these small chicks are able to get through that thin grass. Even in the quail study, when I was actually out tracking quail, we saw that the nests were near a cattle trail. <laughs> and as soon as the, the, the chicks hatched, they hit a cattle trail and they may be a quarter mile away in a relatively short amount of time. So the quail study, basically we took, um, <laughs> We made radio mark quail in southwest Missouri on some prairie sites for five years. We radio marked them in February, followed them all the way through um, breeding, nesting, and then we followed the broods as long as we could into the fall. <coughs> and the take home points of that study showed that nest success was superior on grazed sites. So we found that 33%, we found a 33% nest success on ungrazed sites which is about, if you read literature, um, quail studies, that's about average quail nest success of 33%. In our grazed sites, we were finding 65% nest success. That is significant when you're talking about a species that um, we don't have as many as we used to, and we're trying to really promote that. That's, if we can basically double our nest success just by including cows in a, in a, on a conservation area or private land, that's a huge win. Also, the brood spent less than 5% of their time <coughs> excuse me, on ungrazed portions. So the red outline on this slide is um, the conservation area at Stony Point Prairie here in Dade County. It's 960 acres. Um, we rested a portion of this during the study to show what the quail preferred to use. And it's not hard to see on that west half, the north. North half of the west half was ungrazed and unburned. There was almost zero quail use on that area. Same way on the on the south half of the east half, um, that was a portion that was rested and burned. So there's a direct correlation between quail use and grazing. However, I'm gonna go back to this slide. This is a conservation area. This is 960 acres of contiguous prairie. A lot of times in Missouri, we don't have that 
luxury working with private lands. So we, we use rotational grazing, and most of my landowners are using rotational grazing, uh, grazing systems on their property and incorporating warm season grass. And we are, we are producing the quail on these rotational systems that have a 25 to 30% warm season grass component. However, <coughs> we do need to uh, account for the nest trampling. Um, if, if this slide here, if we have one, a, one animal unit, basically one cow per acre, which um, is, is okay on a rotational system, we, we may see a 20% nest loss. The, the quail nest may get trampled at that stocking rate. That's okay. We're willing to take that risk because we know that the management of the management that those cattle are doing to the grass stand is actually going to be better for the the quail that actually are successful. If we do that, stock, if that stocking rate goes up to five cows per acre, um, a little high, more high intensity grazing, we're going to assume we're going to lose a lot more nests. Um, so. If that is the case, if, if your stocking rate is going to be that high, we do recommend having basically a refuge, protected nesting kind of refuge paddock that won't be grazed until after July 15th to provide some nesting cover that, that has a less chance of um, being trampled. And this is the last thing I want to run through real quick. But this is always uh, on all the grazing workshops. This is kind of the, the take home message that we want to really get through. And this is kind of typical for a, a South Missouri farm. We have it. This is a real example. This is an 80 acre Dade County farm, um, basically fescue based, uh, just your typical, typical farm. So what we want to do, we want to increase uh, profitability basically and provide some wildlife habitat. So we installed cross fences and water to make a rotational grazing system. Then we, but it's still, still fescue based. Um, we included some warm season grass in 2016. That went so included more in 2017. So we are at basically 32 acres of warm season grass, 42 acres of cool season fescue grass in the grazing system. Um, you'll see the dates that we graze. Uh, and the stocking race is, is where it really, really hits home uh, the importance of warm season grass. So basically, Initially, without any cross fences or water or warm season grass, we we're at 15 cow calf pairs, and that number is a real number. Um, sometimes they'd have 17 to 18, but usually they were producing 15 calves off of that 80 acre farm. After the cross fencing and the water, the, you know, after the in installation of the grading system, they were able to bump their their carrying capacity up to 25 pairs, so they were stocking 25 pairs. And getting along pretty good. After the native grass, we were able to go to 30 pairs because now we're not stocking. When it was fescue based, we we're stocking for July and August when the fescue, you know, basically was, was not there. Now we're not stocking for July and August anymore because we have 32 acres of really highly productive native grass. So you can see the profitability of this it is definitely going to um, increase the bottom line for the, the rancher however we are producing actually quail on that farm now that we hadn't seen there in a long time so why is the stocking rate increased it's due to the forage diversity with the in inclusion of the warm season grass the grazing efficiency with the inclusion of the <coughs> of the grazing system we're providing longer rest periods cover and also uh, decreased our inputs such as fertilizer and we're increasing the habitat for a number of different grass and wildlife. I'm going to breeze through this because Dr. Kaiser has already touched on this a lot but we're increased. This is a, a spring calving system on this 80 acre farm so we're getting better weaning weights, um, better conception rates, more grazing days and we're not having any problems with, with hot testing. Um, bottom line is that farm is now producing quail and more cattle. The take home points, we're getting back to the wildlife portion of this. The birds in greatest, in greatest need do, do not nest in trees. We are talking about the grassland. Uh, we'll get birds that nest on the ground. And native forages can help those birds while increasing carrying capacity on your farm and boosting your bottom line. 